reading this evening from the second book of Kings and chapter 5. Second book of Kings, chapter 5. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honourable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valour, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to, to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me. And he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious, and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me. And stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not Abana and the Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, when I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him for a short distance. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman, this Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, 
Indeed, just now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants. And they carried them on ahead of him. When he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now when, uh, now he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you? When the men turned back from his when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous, as white as snow. Amen. God bless the reading of his word to us tonight. We read earlier from Luke 4 the story of how Jesus of Nazareth, having begun his ministry in Galilee and having been everywhere highly spoken of, returns to the hometown of Nazareth and to his home synagogue. And no doubt his reputation having preceded him, the place was packed, packed out to capacity. As a man, he was asked to read from the scriptures and to explain them, and as we saw, he read from the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, and then he rolled up the scroll and began to speak to those present in the synagogue. And in verse 22 of Luke 4, we read that all spoke well of Jesus and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips, though they were clearly astonished that uh, such teaching should come from one of their own. But then there's a marked change of tone in the preacher, and he becomes quite provocative in verse 23, and then in verse 24 he says, Assuredly I say to you that no prophet is accepted in his own country. In other words, you are not going to accept me, even though initially you've responded well to my sermon. You are not going to accept me. And then verse 25, I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the, time, in the day of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three, day, three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And all the people became furious at hearing that, and they tried to lynch him. And that really was quite an extraordinary change in the congregation, wasn't it? At the beginning of the sermon, they marvel at the gracious words that come from his lips, but before he finishes his application, they are furious at what they hear, and they want the preacher dead. I don't suppose there's ever been such a dramatic change of opinion and attitude in a congregation. And the thing that caused them to become so hostile and angry is that Jesus said that God's grace was going out to the Gentiles. Those of you who are familiar with the ministry of the Apostle Paul, as it's described to us in the book of Acts, will remember that when Paul was defending himself once before a mob of Jews in in Jerusalem, in Acts 22, he was given quite a lengthy hearing as he testified about God's dealings with him until you come to verse 21 in that chapter. Then he said to me, Depart, and I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they, that is the Jews, listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with this fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. It's that moment when the peace is broken when they want to get rid of him and kill him. That's the point at which the whole situation erupts. The very idea 
that God should want to have something to do with people like you and me, Gentiles. That was just too much for them to bear. Now I want us to look at that and to think about that for a few weeks. God's grace flowing out to the Gentiles and in particular the grace of God that came to a Gentile named Naaman, the Syrian. You remember our Lord refers to him in the synagogue sermon there at Nazareth uh, before he's thrown out and we read the story of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. We read it earlier on uh, this evening. We'll look at this passage a few times in the next few weeks and at this man Naaman he's quite a pleasant man his name actually means pleasantness and uh, I think that you will find that you'll get to like him the more you get to know him as you read this passage now along with many other preachers it can be a a weakness of mine uh, to spend far too much on the preliminaries of a passage and placing it in its setting and so on I've decided not to do that with two kings Five, uh, you'll you'll get those particular matters dealt with in the coming weeks uh, as we uh, as we go on. But I will just make this one point, and that is to say that this story in Two Kings five is not a parable, and it's not an allegory. That's how it's often used and interpreted. Many have believed and taught it to be so over the years, suggesting that the leprosy of Naaman is. Uh, an allegory for sin and this story then is about the forgiveness of sins that is not what this story is about but 2 kings 5 is never intended to teach that it doesn't teach that and i won't be teaching that this is not a parable it's not an allegory this is a factual story about an actual person it is the story of spiritual realities And about how the grace of God came to this Gentile man. I want to begin the story by looking at it sort of halfway through in verses 15 to 18 tonight. We'll go back to the beginning of the chapter next week, the Lord willing. But I want to begin with this section that teaches us how to recognize a true believer. How to recognize a Christian believer. How to know whether in your life there are the marks of God at work, marks of regeneration, marks of rebirth and renewal. How do I know if my experience, if I've got any kind of spiritual experience at all, how do I know if my experience is a genuine spiritual saving experience? How do I know if God is at work in my life at all? And that's a good question because it's a vitally important question. It's a question that we, each of us, need to ask ourselves individually. Because God, if God isn't doing a work in our lives, then our condition is utterly hopeless. And if we think that there is a work going on in our life, we need to take time to examine it, to check it out, and to be sure that what is happening in our lives is a genuine work of the Spirit of God. Because not every work in us is. Not every spiritual experience is a genuine saving spiritual experience. Genuine in in the sense that it comes from God. There are all kinds of experiences that are being offered to people today under the, the title of spiritual and Christian. But it's vital to know if they are the genuine article or some kind of imitation, counterfeit goods. Let me mention just two extremes that we see in church life today. At one extreme, experience, spiritual experience, never gets mentioned at all. It wasn't mentioned in the church that I first attended as a young man. I used to go along to that church. Spiritual experience was never discussed. People believed they were Christians simply because they'd been baptised And they regularly sat at communion. They were members of the church. But there were absolutely no signs of life in that church. And I think it would be fair and not unkind to say that the people in that church needed to have their assurance that all was well with them, unsettled and stirred up, disturbed. They needed to be shaken up and shaken out of their complacency and be made to ask whether all really was as well as they thought it was with their souls. 
But then there's another extreme that we see, and that is that spiritual experiences can be overemphasized, and that's very much the case today. The modern interest in spiritual experience really began, I suppose, with the 18th century pietists in Germany. They stood against the dry formalism of their day, and in many respects they are the ancestors of modern Pentecostalism. And for them it was inconceivable that anyone who had no experience of the love of God could be a Christian. And in that, of course, they were quite right. But it's more often the case today that people who talk about experience press upon others their particular experience, as though you are not fit to hold up your head and call yourself a Christian if you've not had exactly the same experience that they have had. And far too many Christians today find that their faith is shaken by that in a way that it ought not to be. And so you've got these two extremes that you see in many churches. People who really need to have false assurance, what is really presumption, shaken up because it is false assurance. And yet there are other people who are real Christians who are constantly being brought to despair through meeting other Christians who have had experiences that they don't have and they think, well, then there must be something wrong with me. Why haven't I had that experience? And we need to realize then that spiritual experience is a no sure sign that someone is a Christian at all and has been converted. Judas Iscariot had very deep spiritual experiences. He preached the gospel. He had power to heal the sick and uh, to cast out evil spirits in Jesus' name, and yet he was never converted. He was never a Christian. And I think that just as it was fair and not unkind to say of the first church I went to that they needed their false assurance shaken, so I might even say the same of the church that I attended when I was first converted, which emphasized experience because the, the, the assurance of many such people rest in their experience because they speak in tongues and because they prophesied, well, they thought they must be Christians. And Scripture says, not necessarily so. Spiritual experience is no infallible sign of spiritual life. So from these verses in 2 Kings 5, I want to draw for us tonight the anatomy of a believer. I want to give you the signs. Not all of the signs are here, of course, but there are three remarkable signs that we see in this man, Naaman, of the grace of God at work in his life. They are signs that will be present in your life also if God is at work in you. Now, this story is of how Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, was cleansed of his leprosy. And after his cleansing, Naaman and all his aides, his attendants, went back to Elisha, the man of God, and stood before him and said the remarkable words that we have in verse 15. Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, those words might not strike you as being particularly extraordinary, but I want to tell you that they really are. Here is a man, Naaman, who has completely new convictions and a completely new understanding of the truth about God. And three words stand out there uh, which we are to notice. The three words are, now I know. Now he knows that the God of Israel is the only God in the whole universe, which was an extraordinary thing for a Syrian to say. Because in those days, every nation thought they had their own deity. Everybody believed that there was a multiplicity of gods throughout all the world. A, a Christian uh, in, in college with me was from Hong Kong, and he, he spoke about life in Hong Kong and uh, the calendars there in the city. He said they have a different God for every month of the year. And as you go around Hong Kong and see all the multi-story uh, blocks of flats around the city, 
In almost every window you'll see these little red lights, he said, burning in the windows. And they're there like little shrines to the various gods that are worshipped in those homes. It's just taken for granted that there are many, many gods. Now in the world, in the Western world, we sort of more traditionally believe in one god. But we're just as idolatrous as anybody else. Because we think that there are many roads to the one God. In other words, that there are many religions, and each religion is legitimate. Each religion is a viable option in our search for the one God. And that's taken as self-evident in our education system today, where the authorities tell us that all the children in school should learn that there are lots of religions And they ought to learn about them. But also behind that idea is the assumption that really they're all very much the same. That they're all roads to the one God. That there are many, many ways. Now true Christians don't believe that. The believer in the days of the Old Testament... And believers in the days of the New Testament and to this day stand apart from their contemporaries and from the almost universal consensus of the day. Believers then and now stand apart in believing that there is only one God and that he has revealed himself in only one way. In the Old Testament days, it was eccentric for people to think like that. And in New Testament days also, and to this day, people think that it's far too dogmatic, far too narrow-minded for people to talk like this, to say there's one God and only one way to him. And it's quite an experience then to read through the Scriptures and to find how extraordinary the Scriptures are in its insistence on the exclusivity of religion, that there is one God and there is one way to him. Do you remember, um, for example, in the book of Jonah? Um, let me just read to you from Jonah chapter, chapter 1. Jonah was caught there in the storm. And do you remember how he spoke about himself to the sailors? I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. It's a marvelous confession. It set him apart from those sailors who believed in Lots of gods. And then later on he went to preach in the city of Nineveh. And when the people repented and the Lord had mercy on on them, Jonah said to God, well, it's just like you. I knew as soon as there was a tear of repentance, you'd forgive them. You're a gracious God. You can't be trusted to be anything else than that. And Jonah was in a bad mood and a temper because he wanted God to destroy Nineveh. But it's very interesting to notice in that short Old Testament book, Jonah only tells you two things about God, and they're quite unique. And everyone around him was ignorant of these truths, and they still are unique to God today. Christian theology has never really got beyond it. Jonah says that there is only one creator in heaven and earth, and he is a gracious God, and it is impossible for him to be anything other than that. And that concept, that revelation, is unique to Old Testament and New Testament scripture. No other religion in the world has ever said that about God. And on this occasion, in in 2 Kings 5, this brilliant soldier, Naaman, who I, I imagine had a theological knowledge of, of zero, suddenly discovers this gracious God and he says, now I know that there is a real God. Now I know that. Up until then, the only thing he really knew about was military maneuvers and tactics. Syria and Israel were bitter enemies then as they are today. That hasn't changed one little bit and as a commander of the Syrian army he probably knew a great deal about the Israeli army but I doubt he knew anything at all about Israel's God 
But becoming a Christian means coming to a knowledge, a, a knowledge of the truth concerning God. Paul says that to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, where he gives this definition of what it means to be saved. God, he says, desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. To be saved means to know the truth. And this isn't an academic sort of knowledge. It is the enlightenment of the mind. It is an intellectual knowledge of spiritual truth. And to possess this knowledge, a man doesn't need to have any advanced education. In, actually, in, in terms of this world, he hardly needs any education at all, so to speak. There have been many who have been converted who've had no formal education at all. And yet, they find they have formed very full convictions and may well know more about the Bible than the minister of the local chapel. Many have found that. People who had no educational background and very, very limited understanding of the world in which they're living, and yet when it comes to the things of God, they've got great convictions and extensive knowledge. The spiritual fog has been blown out of their mind, and they can see where they are and where they're going, and they just want to know more and more about that. And isn't it very striking that when we read of the first Christians in the book of Acts, the men and women who repented and believed on the day of Pentecost, we're told that from the moment they repented and believed and received the Holy Spirit, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. That was the first thing they did. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to doctrine. That's very striking. Because before someone becomes a Christian, it's the very last thing they want to do. It would be the most incredible bore to them to study the apostles' doctrine before they become a Christian. But these early Christians now have a tremendous thirst to know. That's always been a mark of true Christianity. And it's an important aspect of, of Christian outreach in our own country today, it seems to me, there are many people who need to come under the educating influence of the Christian church for them to have any knowledge at all of spiritual things. And not only to know about God, but to have any knowledge at all. Most of us here this morning, I think, uh, this evening, have very little idea about the educational standards of many people, particularly in the cities of our country. 20% of teenagers leave school unable to read. Isn't that astonishing? And yet it is true historically that many people who were illiterate on coming to faith in Christ immediately begin to read, to learn to read. And the great incentive is that they should know the truth. That becomes a driving force in their life. They want to know the truth. And what we see with this man, Naaman, is that not only did he come to know the truth from nothing, but that he also became able to distinguish truth from error. We see that exemplified in the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, where we find him as Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, a man full of convictions, a very intelligent man, full of convictions, which was so strong that he wanted to destroy the church and destroy the name of Jesus Christ. You see, you can have strong convictions without being a Christian, but his convictions were all wrong. In fact, he was typical of some of the most dangerous people in life today. People who have religious and political convictions that are wrong and who want to just drive everybody to adopt their view and they'll use any force and any violence to do that if they have to. We're seeing reports of that, aren't we, from Syria? Well, that's what Saul of Tarsus was like. But we read of him in Acts chapter 9 and verse 18, after he's converted, after he becomes a new man, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized 
So when he had received food and was strengthened, Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called in on his, this name in Jerusalem? And he's come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? And then we read in verse 22, But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus was the Christ. Something happened to Saul of Tarsus. He came to know the truth, so that he could say to those people in Damascus, now I know what I didn't know two days ago, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It wasn't that he said, I know this for myself. A lot of people are like that. I know the truth for myself, I just can't explain it to anybody else. Well, that's not much good, is it? You see, not only did he know it for himself, but he could go to these learned people who were steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, and he could confound them by proving from those very scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. It's very striking to see that. This is one of the great signs that God has begun to work in our lives, that enlightenment comes to us. So that we can say, however simply, now I know. It's just what happened to the late Professor Tasker. He was Professor of New Testament Studies at King's College in in London University. He was a liberal scholar. That means he didn't believe in miracles, he didn't believe in the supernatural, and sure he was lecturing in New Testament studies, quite typical of his day and generation. And during the war years, he was invited along to Westminster Chapel, and he sat under the ministry of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and bit by bit he found that his attitude to the Bible was beginning, beginning to change until just after the war his life was revolutionized by an address given by Dr. Lloyd-Jones on the authority of the Bible. And that night, Tasker met with Christ, and his whole mind was changed. And this man, who had previously challenged the trustworthiness of Scripture, went into the university and stood before the the students and said, Now I know that the Bible is the Word of God. That certainty, that knowledge, comes when God is at work in us. And if you look at what Naaman says here, you will find that he uses a very important negative. He stands before Elisha and he says in verse 15, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth. It's a very important negative. It isn't enough to say, Now I know that your God is okay. There's a lot of that going on today. Isn't there? Everybody trying to be polite about religion. I think your God is fine, and of course, my God is fine too, and so I'll agree with your religion just so long as you agree with my religion. That's what's going on all the time in interfaith dialogues that we hear about. Naaman says, Now I know that there is no God except yours. That is typical of the Bible. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the positive. And then immediately a negative. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now that's what Naaman is doing here. He has come to acknowledge the truth. He's able to distinguish between truth and error. And he expresses his faith in a very exclusive and unambiguous way. And that shows us that Naaman is a truly converted man. He's a true believer. Not because he says that he feels different, but because he says, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except the God of Israel. Now I know. It's the language of real conviction. Once I was blind, but now I see. And I want to ask you if in the mercy of God that is the kind of language that you can use. Now I know. You may know many other things or perhaps you don't know very much at all. 
But you've got very, different, very definite convictions about Jesus Christ, that he's God's son, and the Bible is God's word. And you say, now I know that. Jesus once spoke to his disciples about themselves being blessed because he said there are many people who longed to see the things that you see and to know the things that you know, but they weren't able. And the same can be said today in another sense of every believer. We have this great privilege of knowing God. It's one of the first, well, it is the first mark, the first indication of God beginning to work in our lives, a new understanding about him. The second mark of Naaman coming to faith is there at the end of verse 15. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he, that is, Elijah said, as the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I'll receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Now, I won't spend long on this tonight. Elisha's position is very understandable, isn't it? If you know anything about paganism, and we see a lot of that around us today, ancient and modern, you'll know that you never get religious blessings without paying for them. The holy man in India, well, he's always got his hand out. That has always been the case, and alas, it is sometimes the case in the church too. It shouldn't be. The church, the church ought to show that it's not out for what it can get, but the church is out to give. And Elisha didn't want there to be any misunderstanding at all. He wanted there to be no under, misunderstanding about the fact that God can't be bought and the blessings of God can't be bought. But we've all seen the TV evangelists asking for money. It's an awful thing. But here we see the complete opposite, don't we? Here is a new convert, a new believer, and he comes to the man of God and says, I want to give but the minister won't let me. It's a mark of a change in someone's life. When instead of the flow being, give to me, give to me, give to me, it becomes, take from me. I want to give. The truly converted person becomes a giver, and learning to give can be a difficult thing. What do I give to? And what shall I give? How shall I give? But what a wonderful thing it is to want to give. And the Christian gives, not because he's good, but because God has given to him. That's the rule of the road in the Christian life. When God has given you something, you have to pass it on if you don't want to lose it. It's a, that's a nonsense to unbelievers, I know. But the Christian realizes that God has forgiven him, and therefore he must quickly forgive others if he doesn't want to lose the joy of God's forgiveness. God gives you his love, Christian quickly passes that love on to others, and yet we can so easily and quickly forget that. Naaman is given much, so he wants to give much. Naturally, it's a, it's a sign of his gratitude, and that's one of the surest signs that God is at work in our lives. You don't have to speak in tongues to be a Christian, but you do have to speak with gratitude. Thanksgiving to God I don't know what's happened in your life the last few months. Perhaps the last year with your children has been an unbelievable pain. But you thank God for them. It might have been a hard year in work for you. And perhaps the past year has been a real trial, a real pain. But still you look back on that with gratitude to God. And that's a miracle of God's grace. The world isn't thankful. But here's Naaman saying, Take me, take this, use it. Let, let me give, let me support, let me make a contribution. I'm a debtor. That's the genuine article. It's a sign that God is at work in us. It's a sign, not that you've turned over a new leaf or that you've reformed yourself, but it's a sign that you've been renewed by the Spirit of God. Naaman has been changed. It isn't just that he's been cured of his leprosy. First, he's got new convictions about God that soldiers generally don't have. And secondly, his wallet has been converted. And he's not holding on to it now. He's holding it out before Elisha. And Elisha is saying, oh, sorry, I, I, I can't. I really mustn't. 
And so when you read through the story, as we'll come eventually to verse 23, and that story of Gehazi comes out, I think, uh, I think Naaman could probably see through Gehazi. He must have been very suspicious about Gehazi coming after him, looking for money. Nevertheless, when Gehazi tells Naaman that pack of lies, Naaman says, by all means, don't take one, take two. That's the spirit of Naaman. Generous, outgoing, reaching out to others. That's a mark of a real change, of a real Christian. He wants to share what God has given to him. We can sometimes fail at that point. Selfishness grows in us. And everything begins to turn inwards. And it all becomes about me and mine. But when the Spirit of God is at work in us, out it goes again. We have to. It's an expression of thankfulness to God. Now, thirdly and lastly, notice what Naaman says in verse 17. Uh, Elijah has received this gift, uh, has refused to receive this gift, and then Naaman says, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. What on earth is that about? Well, Naaman has got to go back to Syria. And the king of Syria leans on Naaman's arm. Evidently, the king held Naaman in very high regard, as you see in chapter 1 of the chapter. And he's got to go back to the king. And here is Naaman on his return, going to the temple of Rimmon, a false god, with the king. And imagine behind him now come two servants carrying a sack of earth. And they split it open and they pour it out on the floor of the temple of Rimmon, and Naaman stands on that earth. I think it was a very vivid way of him saying to his people who thought that the God of Israel was simply a national God who belonged to the territory of Israel and their soil. And what he's saying is, I have brought Israel's soil because I believe in Israel's God. Now, that can't have been very easy for Naaman's wife. Imagine her embarrassment. You can imagine, perhaps, all the other lady Syrians of high society asking her, what was your husband doing today? What was he doing with all that dirt? It can be very embarrassing for our relatives when we are first converted. I remember when my mother was first converted. The embarrassment she caused the family. Everybody in the village knew about it. And some of my aunts and some of my uncles stopped visiting our house. It was so embarrassing. And sometimes, perhaps, ma'am was a little bit insensitive about that. But she nailed her colours to the mast. And here's Naaman, with a renewed, sensitive conscience... And he's got the courage to confess Israel's God whilst he is the commander of the army of Syria. That must have took some doing. And no doubt his job was at risk and his reputation would have been on the line. He risks everything, but so be it. He's going to do it. And Elisha says to him, go in peace. You see, there's no suggestion in the Bible that becoming a believer means that you've got to retreat from the world and retreat from society and shut yourself away. Naaman doesn't say, oh, well, I I won't go back to the house of Rimmon and I won't go back to Syria. I'll stay here. There's no suggestion of that. And that's very interesting. We find um, the prophet Obadiah in Ahab's household supplying the needs of a hundred prophets whom he had hidden. Imagine being in charge of Ahab's household with a woman like Jezebel on the prowl around the place. Jezebel, who made Elijah run for his life. We're told Obadiah feared the Lord greatly in that difficult place. But he didn't run away from there. He didn't pull out of it. And neither did Naaman. For all we know, 
he may well have been in, uh, dismissed from his job and discharged from the army of Syria. Who knows? In disgrace, but he has this intense desire to continue and to fulfill his responsibilities now as a believer and to make it quite plain where he stood. And you see that in verse 17. Look at the end of the verse. Your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Put that together with verse 15. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. There is no other God. And then in verse 17, I will never again worship any other God but this one. Never again. Isn't that striking? I'm going back to Syria. We may say, I'm going back to the factory. I'm going back to the shop. I'm going back to the schoolroom where everybody else is an unbeliever and where they're all going to laugh at me if I confess faith in Christ. I'm going back to that place where it will be so hard to live as a Christian, but I will never again worship any other God but the Lord. That is a sure sign that someone's converted, that someone has been changed. There's no doubting it. So let me summarize these three marks. Christianity is a matter really of keeping the first commandment and the second, but primarily the first. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That is the very last thing that anybody does by nature. But what has happened to Naaman is that God has changed him and made him able to keep the first commandment. Commandment First, by teaching him that there is no other God to love. And secondly, by teaching him not to give his love to any other. And it's as simple as that. The whole purpose of the work of God in the soul of Naaman and any other person is to make them realize who God is and to recognize that they must give to God alone what is due to him, worship, and not give it to any other rival. That is basic Bible faith. That is basic Bible living. And the God of grace alone can do that in us, giving us a desire to love God and never, ever again give our love to a false God. Only God can do that for you. How blessed we are that God has had mercy on us. That he's opened our eyes to see that there is a God. and That we have to give ourselves to him and live our lives before him. And that, that is the only thing that makes sense of life at all. That's what happened to Naaman. That's what happened to him. We'll find out what else happened to him next week. But do you know God? You worship God only. If, if you're a Christian, that'll be true of you. And if you don't know God and if you don't worship him alone, well, then it's quite clear that you need the work of God in your soul to change you, to convert you, to make you right with him. Lord bless his word to us.